All right. Um, well, this mic is sort of doing something, so I might just end up yelling, but I guess we'll see. Um, okay, cool. Um, oh, were we? Are we good? Okay, we're good. Um, yeah, so so thanks a lot for having me. Uh, it's it's fun to to be here. Uh, like Kevin said, I'm uh, here from Stanford. I hope you don't hold it against me. Um, but uh, I managed to make it just in time through the Bay Area traffic. Uh, today I'm going to talk about RLHF, something that people are probably a little bit familiar with, but if not, that's okay. We'll try to cover it more or less, not quite from zero, but but uh, give some background. Um, I, I tried to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, I, you know, I do want people to actually learn from this. If you have questions, let me know. I might have to start ignoring them if we get crunched for time, but um, uh, feel free to raise your hand and I'll do my do my best as we go without further ado. Um, so, okay, if you're in this class, I guess a lot of people maybe are not in the class, but you, you're probably familiar with reinforcement learning. And if you're, um, you know, a human being these days, you've probably heard something about language models, but why are we talking about reinforcement learning for language models? And there are a lot of ways I think to do this slide. I thought about doing some like long timeline of like NLP and like RL and showing them converging. But I think really the main idea here is like, GPT-3 was cool. All of your researcher friends were like, whoa, have you seen this you know, new model? And then ChatGPT came around and it was like your grandma was like, yo, have you seen this new model? And these are just totally different levels of you know, permeation in kind of the, the public consciousness. And, and yeah, so, so the question is kind of what, what was between these two things? What, what was added? Um, and it really is this sort of um, more or less one weird trick, which, which is RL from human feedback. And that's what, uh, what we're gonna talk about today. Um, as just a little bit of background, um, so that uh, we're all a little bit more on the same page if people are not um, uh, as familiar with, with language models, um, what, what is a language model? Uh, for, for our purposes today, um, you can just think of a language model as an autoregressive model over tokens. Um, and, and, and tokens, you can really just think of as words. Sometimes there'll be subwords um, or, or, or word pieces, but, but for the most part, it's basically just an autoregressive model over Words, um, we'll have some vocabulary, which is the set of possible tokens. And um, in, in sort of modern large language models, this will be something like 50,000, but, but can, can vary quite a bit. Um, and basically your, your language model, your policy um, here maps token sequences um, to a distribution over the next token. Uh, pretty, pretty simple stuff. Um, and when we start thinking about reinforcement learning, um, we'll think of states as being sequences of tokens. Um, and actions can be either individual tokens or actually quite commonly, they will also be sequences of tokens. So um, although you can, you might think of it sort of naturally to think of like each token is an action um, in, in a lot of the, the work that's out there, um, people tend to actually think of this as sort of a, a contextual bandit setting where um, you get some context, some prompt, a sequence of, uh, of tokens um, and you emit a single action, which is your sort of response sequence. <clears throat> and so, you know, to make this very concrete, right? If you're using ChatGPT, um, you know, in this sort of banded problem, you have like your first state, which is whatever you type in, um, and you know the, your your action is um, uh, uh, the model's response. Um, and now, if you have sort of multiple turns of dialogue, your state just becomes um, you know the 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 first uh, input, first response, and the next input, and your your action is just your next response. There, there's a paper here I, I noted at the bottom: this uh, contrastive preference learning, learning from human feedback without RL. Um, which is a very recent uh, preprint, but if you're interested in more of this discussion about sort of uh, the contextual bandit versus per token MDP kind of formulations of how we do RL on language models, um, that paper has some good discussion of this, both in the main text and the appendix. So if you're, if you're really hungry for more, uh, I invite you to check it out. But I, I'm going to stick to this sort of bandit formulation because that's what most of the, the work so far ha has used and, and, and sort of the basis of the algorithms we're going to talk about. Okay, so with that out of the way, um, the, the, the sort of the, what we're gonna cover today is basically three main sections. So I'm gonna do kind of a primer on RLHF for people who are not familiar with it. Um, this is sort of the, the algorithm, at least as far as we know it, because we don't really know. Um, but as far as we know, what was you know, done to give us ChatGPT, uh, I'm gonna talk about um, a, a newer algorithm that simplifies some of the uh, complexity in this, in this um, original formulation of reinforcement learning from human feedback on language models, which is called direct preference optimization. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some some applications and one in particular um, to, to prove that um, it was it was worth coming 
to to listen to this monologue. Hopefully it's not a monologue. Hopefully we'll have some good questions. Um, okay, so part one, uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback. Um, I'm gonna just give you the first couple steps of this, this pipeline. The, the, the way that RLHF is done on these big language models basically has four main steps. And, and the first two are pretty straightforward. So the first one is just uh, unsupervised pre-training. And this is actually just GPT-3. So if you stop after step zero here, you get GPT-3. You take a ton of text from the internet and we're talking trillions of words um, of text from the internet. Uh, you just do unsupervised generative modeling condition on a sequence predict the next token, do this a lot on a lot of A100s for a lot of hours, and you get out uh, this unsupervised pre-trained model. And this is this pure autoregressive uh, generative model over text. Um, after we do that, um, we're actually going to uh, do some supervised fine tuning first on human demonstrations. And so this basically uh, gets the behaviors that we're interested in, in really learning and refining um, in distribution for the model. Um, we can talk a little bit more later about why this is so important, but um, um, basically you can think of these first two steps as kind of learning the, the background knowledge about the world in step zero. And then step one is um, doing just a little bit of fine tuning on some human written demonstrations of, you know, what would be a good way to respond to this example prompt, like write a poem about jazz or whatever. And so we fine tune that original unsupervised pre-trained model and we get this SFT model. And then the question is, what do we do next? Um, and, and I think, you know, a question here is also like, why? why do anything next? I mean, why not just stop at step one? You know, uh, supervised learning works really well. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, it, it, two in particular, one is that, um, and we'll talk about this a little more, it, it's kind of hard to scale this annotation of human demonstrations. Uh, it's really laborious, right? If, if you, if you, you know, want to come up with demonstrations of like, how am I supposed to respond to queries? Like write me, you know, a sassy poem in the style of Snoop Dogg about quantum mechanics. Like it's going to be difficult. Um, and it's going to take time to collect those annotations. And also, if you want to actually exceed human performance on a lot of these um, tasks, um, you know, obviously imitating human behavior um, is not likely to, to give you a policy that's actually going to do better than humans. And so these are some of the reasons, both from the perspective of scaling up the annotations and also just uh, getting a really strong model that we might want to do this. Okay, so so hopefully you're you're somewhat convinced we want to try to train these sort of general purpose language agents using RL. Um, and, and I think you know probably the most obvious question then is, well, okay, like what what are we going to optimize? What is the reward? Um, and what what properties should it have? Now, ideally, like we want a reward that's going to assign high reward to stuff humans like and low reward to stuff that humans don't like. Now, this is this is a big oversimplification, as I noted in the bottom of the slide. Um, but the point is that knowing what uh, what should have high reward really requires knowing something about humans. So it's it's probably not uh, enough to use um, uh, something sort of simple and hard coded or some sort of closed form reward. We probably really are going to need to elicit some sort of you know particular annotations or behaviors from humans to to learn in in sort of like an inverse rl kind of setup except we might not be taking demonstrations from humans we might be getting some other kinds of um, um data from them that we can use to to infer this sort of reward function that's actually worth optimizing and so the question is where do we where do we get this mysterious reward function um fortunately i'm gonna tell you so um maybe the first thing we might think of is like all right like let's just ask humans for a reward reward, right? Like, I'm going to show you model behaviors. And if you really like it, you'll give me a big number. And if you don't like it, you're going to give me a small number. Um, and you could do this. Um, but I'm curious, like, what number would you give this response? Right? Like, can we just like raise hands and people give like one through five? I know I said one through 10, one through five, like, what do people give this? We got a five, we got an, we got an eight out of five. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> Three. Okay, so yeah, I mean, th this was a silly exercise, but I hope it makes it clear that um, it, it's sort of an underspecified task here. And, and you could have different people that maybe rank different responses the same way, but they might sort of differ in a monotonic transformation of the rewards. And so uh, you might have high disagreement among your labelers that, that becomes annoying to model. And so uh, maybe we can do a simpler task, right? Maybe instead of just giving rewards directly, it's a lot easier to say which two of these responses is more helpful, right? Um, like, like who thinks the response on the left is more helpful, right? So we're going to see much higher agreement a lot of the time, at least when we ask for responses, uh, this way. And also, um, a lot more people raised their hand, right? Cause it was a lot easier to make that judgment than it was to give me a number. 
And so this sort of gets at this point of the first point before of it's easier to scale annotation this way because it's much easier to put two responses in front of a person and say, which do you like better than it is to say, write me a good demonstration response or come up with a number that you think captures how good this response is. And so this is exactly how we're going to collect um, uh, feedback from humans in order to, to learn this reward function. So this feedback that we're gonna get is gonna come as preferences over model samples. So you remember we did that supervised fine tuning step. So our model will roughly do the sort of things that we care about. Um, and what we do then is we have some data set of unlabeled prompts. We collect two model samples from each prompt um, and then we put them in front of humans and the human says that one's better. And then we end up with this data set of these uh, triples X, YW and YL where the, the YW is sort of the preferred or the winning response and, and YL is the loser. And then the question is, okay, we have this data. It sort of feels like this is helpful for learning a reward, but how exactly do we do that? Um, and this is where some, some older uh, models from, from the economics literature, um, in particular, the one that's widely used is this Bradley Terry model that relates uh, some score function or utility function, maybe a reward function uh, to preferences. Um, and so uh, in, in particular, the, the Bradley Terry model is is built for um, discrete choice and in particular binary choice settings where a human has to decide between two choices. And we're modeling the probability that they're gonna prefer choice A to choice B. And we model it as this, uh, this sort of Boltzmann distribution of um, the, the difference in their, in their scores. And, and, and this, this score function is sort of this unobserved, uh, implicit sort of latent scoring function that we sort of hypothesize exists, but we only get to observe the human's choices. All right, so now we have a probabilistic model that relates discrete binary choices, which is what we have in our data, to some scoring function. And we can just turn this into a loss function on a reward model um, and, and do maximum likelihood, right? So we just replaced S here with R phi, which is our reward model that's that's got some parameters. Um, and, and we're just going to do maximum likelihood, likelihood here on our data set of preference uh, data. Uh, and uh, out pops uh, a reward model that we can then optimize. Okay, so th this is sort of the the human feedback part of the RLHF. Are we good? Okay. Okay, so we got a little stuck here, but now we figured it out. Good for us. So we, we got uh, these new prompts. Um, and again, we're gonna use the human, but this time we're gonna use the human to give us these preference pairs over model samples from the SFT model. You know, one, one of my uh, office mates told me this figure is too overwhelming for a lecture. And, um, I hope he was wrong. Um, so step two, we fit this reward model, right? With these, with these, with this preference data we have over the, the SFT samples. All right, so we're almost there. Um, you know, we have this like SFT model that like kind of does what we want. We now have this reward model, which allegedly like assigns high reward to good stuff and low reward to bad stuff. So like now, you know, we need to actually just fine tune this policy. Um, and, and I say allegedly here because you know, it's sort of silly, right? Like we have a single reward function that gives you an input and an output and it gives you one number that says how good it is. Like if you think even a little bit about this, it doesn't make any sense at all, right? Like people have dis different opinions on what's good and what's bad. And so in some ways it's almost surprising RLHF works as well as it does because like the fact that we can make this unbelievably restrictive assumption that there's like a single like reward function for all of humanity that's like worth optimizing is, is a little bit silly. And that's an interesting direction for future research. So uh, please, please figure that out. We want to represent uh, all sorts of, um, all sorts of uh, value systems. Okay, so we have this reward function and now we want to learn a policy, right? That achieves high reward. Um, so this is just RL, right? Which I've been told, you know, something about. Um, now, that's the obvious bit. I mean, do people have any thoughts on what can go wrong if we just optimize this? And I don't, I, I kind of glanced through the lectures that you guys have had, but I'm curious if people have um, any guesses on this. It's not rhetorical. If you have a thought, you can actually raise your hand and, and say what you think. You don't have to, but you could. Or not. Oh, yes. Um, I would say that perhaps if you're just like the, the training data uh, could be just written by like suboptimal like responses from the human, um, mm -hmm. perhaps on purpose to like train the training. Yeah. Yeah, so that's definitely a problem. Um, so, so one thing you'll find actually if you fit these reward models on real data is like it, it, this reward model is basically a classifier, right? If I, I have some data that's like binary preferences over, over uh, responses, if I fit my reward model and then measure how accurately it actually assigns higher reward to the thing that the human says it's better, it'll be like under 70%. 
So, so these preferences are super noisy and that, that can be a problem. I'm thinking of something else though. It's a good point though. Any other guesses? We got one in the back. Yeah, so I mean, that's, I don't wanna give you full credit for that because like if any, in any machine learning lecture, if someone's like, okay, so we do this thing, well, what can go wrong here? You can always say distribution shift and it like will kind of sound right. Unfortunately, it is sort of right here. So I have to give you some credit. Um, but I want to talk about a specific kind of distribution shift, um, which is that um, if you recall, right, we, well, the, the answer, sorry, is that we want to add some term here to keep our, our policy that we're fine tuning from the SFT model close to the SFT model. And the reason for this, right, is our reward model was trained on pairs of trajectories or responses from our SFT model, right? So, so sort of by definition, our reward model is probably going to be most accurate around things that the SFT model assigns high likelihood to. And so if we optimize this without this constraint to oblivion, uh, we're probably going to end up in some uh, area of the action space where our reward model is giving us totally garbage rewards. Um, and we're going to sort of over optimize our reward model. So it, it's going to look like we're getting higher and higher and higher reward. But when you put those responses in front of humans, they're going to say that's garbage. OK, so so that is that is what I mean. So yes, it is distribution shift. Um, and, and now that we have this whole objective, uh, we're just going to optimize this whole thing with PPO. I don't know if people are familiar with PPO. It's an RL algorithm. You don't have to use PPO, but that's what John Shulman decided. And therefore, that's the world that we live in. Um, it's a PPO It's a PPO world out there. Um, so, so that basically final, finishes out uh, our, our pipeline for RLHF here, right? So we do unsupervised pre-training, we do SFT, we fit this reward model. And then finally, we, we, um, we, we take our data set of just unlabeled prompts again. We might have a new data set of unlabeled prompts and we do RL with this reward model. And we end up with a policy. And uh, that's basically ChatGPT. So far. Um, another view of this um, process, which I've included here because it's even more complicated than my figure. And I think it kind of makes me look better um, for that reason. So I've included it here. Um, but, but the point here really um, pedagogically is that this pipeline is really complicated. Um, you know, this is if you include all of the actual pieces of PPO, right? We have the, um, the, the sort of the old policy. We have the SFT model that our KL constraint is computed from. We have a reward model. We also have a value function that we're fitting sort of online as we're training the model. We also have our policy. And then we have a replay buffer as well. It's very complicated. Um, and, and this is, you know, non-trivial. Nonetheless, the recipe really does work. Um, so this is from the, the um, quote unquote uninstruct GPT paper, um, the, the paper that came out when OpenAI released DaVinci 003, um, which is the, the immediate predecessor to ChatGPT. Um, and, and there are a couple of things to point out here. I mean, first thing is we're evaluating win rates here. Okay, so the, the y-axis is basically how often a uh, human prefers the response of that model to the response of the 175 billion parameter SFT model, okay? Um, which is why on the SFT curve, right, it ends up always fine. Um, and and what's, what's sort of interesting here, right, is um, humans like the 1.3B RLHF model better than the 175B SFT model. And like, if you haven't worked with language models, these numbers are just numbers flying through the air. But like 1.3B is like, I can run it on my like 2070 TI. 175B is like, I pay an engineering team to like fine tune this model. Um, and so uh, that's a that's a really interesting kind of difference in scale, um, and also importantly, like the gains continue to uh, to show up even as the model gets really big, right? So it's not like this just helps us maybe do better when we have a really small model. Even when we have a really big model with a lot of capacity to work with, uh, this this is still helpful. Um, and and you know GPT four allegedly is like out here. That could be misinformation, so take that with a grain of salt. But, um, Okay, so so um, RLHF works. Um, I want to mention just a couple quick variations that I think are kind of neat here. So this is a really recent paper that talked about quality diversity from human feedback. Um, and here, what they do is they use they use human feedback um, not to learn a reward function, but to learn sort of a diversity metric, uh, basically a latent space that captures uh, what humans find more or less similar. So here they'll show a human three images, and they'll say for image A, uh, let's compare this to image B and C. Which one do you think is more similar to image A? And they use this type of feedback to learn this uh, latent, latent space. And, and what they've shown here then is they, they've written some prompt like an astronaut riding a horse, um, and they've used clip. Do you know what clip is? Oh, some nods. 
That was me. Okay. Um, so clip is a model that it, it jointly embeds text and images into a joint embedding space. So you can sort of write text and find images that are similar or embed images and caption them. So, so what they've done is they embedded this caption like an astronaut riding a horse. They found on the left, that's just the eight images that are closest to that label, right? They're all correct, but they're all really similar. What they've done on the right here is they partitioned the space that they learned from human feedback into 16 cells. And then they found the nearest image in each cell. And what is interesting is that you still get good matches to the prompt for all of them, but you have clearly higher diversity by constraining uh, your, your images in this way. Okay, so this is another thing that we can learn from human feedback. It's not just about learning reward models. Um, another thing that's neat is RL with AI feedback. So, so this is what um, this is how uh, uh, Claude works, um, uh, which um, you know is, is Anthropic's sort of um, offering in in a similar sort of chatbot space. Um, and basically, the deal here is we want to learn dialogue models that are not just helpful. It's not that, just that they will tell you whatever you want, um, but we also want them to have some sort of guardrails, right? We don't want them to tell you how to um, you know. Uh, do bad things. I'm not even going to give examples because everybody disagrees on what is a bad thing. But you know, there are certain queries we want these models to refuse, right? Um, and one way to do this is to just ask humans, right? Like, here's a pair of responses, which is more harmful. Um, but another thing you can do is you can do the normal RLHF thing with just the helpful data. So just where you have data where humans say which is like a better response. And then you actually use the model you get out of that to give you the harmlessness annotations. So instead of having to ask humans then what's uh, more harmful, you just show this purely helpful model pairs of responses and it'll give you those labels and this works. Okay, so wrapping up the RLHF uh, section here, um, one of the key points here is humans can provide more scalable feedback with comparison than they can through demonstration. And, and this is a special case of a more general phenomenon or general question, which is like, what is the best way to do scalable oversight on powerful models, right? And, and it seems like uh, you know, th this is one useful way. And I say it's scalable both in terms of collecting a lot of the data, but also quality too. It's, it's probably more scalable in terms of if we want to get the model better than humans, it's going to be easier to do that with comparisons than with demonstrations. Uh, the next big thing is we use this theoretical preference model or choice model um, to derive this objective for reward learning. And that's really where the meat of the, the work is here. And once we do that, we just fine tune um, with, with, with more or less off the shelf RL with this learn reward and we get a great model. Yay. Okay. Um, RLHF is over. Any questions? Okay. Um, so now we're going to talk about DPO. Um, so, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. So, like, it's just not a regressive model. So it's just a, it's just a language model. It takes a sequence of tokens um, and gives you a distribution over the next token. And then when you like roll out your policy, you get a prompt, a sequence of uh, uh, tokens, you predict the next one, you sample from that distribution. So you, like an episode is like a whole sequence that you would like take an action at every time step? Uh, yeah, so it kind of depends on what we call an action here. You can call an action an individual token or you can call an action a whole output sequence until your model outputs sort of a special like end of sequence token basically. Um, so yeah, either either a, a trajectory or an episode is like a single action if you take that view, or it's yeah a sequence of of actions if you take the per token view. Yeah. Have they experimented with preference models? Like this seems like it's always a dichotomy between two options. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So have they experimented with like ranks to see? Yeah, so so there, there are pretty straightforward generalizations of Bradley Terry to rankings over many responses, which is a, a, a general family called Plackett Loose models. Um, which is which looks very similar to the Bradley Terry model. Um, yeah, and and there there are there are also a lot of questions about when we pick this preference model, what are we actually assuming is the underlying parameter? And and we sort of assumed that this preference model is relating rewards to preferences. It's actually not obvious that should be the case. It could be something else like advantages. And there's really recent work uh, looking into that, like in that paper I mentioned earlier, the contrastive preference learning, where they talk about per token versus per sequence. Uh, they they get into that. Okay, um, let's talk about DPO. Um, I love these questions, though. Um, so, so what's not ideal about RLHF with PPO, as I've described it? Well, there's this implementation complexity issue. There are the resource requirements. So again, we have all these different models flying around. We have the reward model, the value model, the policy, the reference model, um, and just ability of training. So, so the, the rewards actually have this extra degree of freedom when we fit them, right? Because this loss function only, only cares about the difference between rewards. So I can, I can shift my rewards for a particular prompt, right? If we fix x. I can shift the rewards by an arbitrary constant that doesn't change the loss. And the real issue is that the constant can be different for every prompt. And so what we, what we could conceptually at least end up with is a reward function that 
for a particular prompt, the relative rewards make sense, but you can't even compare rewards across inputs. So this would make it really, really difficult to like fit a value function when we're doing RL. So let's get rid of all of these issues. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, this, this algorithm direct preference optimization, which, which basically simplifies um, the pipeline we've talked about. And, and the punchline here is that if we parameterize the reward model in a special way, if we pick sort of a particular architecture for a reward model, um, we can just extract the optimal policy for that reward model in closed form. We don't actually have to do any RL, um, which is good. Um, and, and the main idea here is that um, it, w w there is a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between optimal policies and reward models. So, so given a particular reward model, or reward function, there's a closed form expression for the optimal policy, which is intractable, but we can actually use that um, still, at least in our training objective, to make it a lot easier to train the policy. Um, and I'm going to show you how. OK, so we have this RLHF objective. We already talked about this. This isn't new. So we have um, our data set of prompts here. And then we have this expectation over responses from our model. We want high reward, and we want low KL, or nothing new. Um, and, and this is for any reward function. And, and what you can show, and this is this is like a couple lines of algebra, it's in the DPO paper and many other, several other papers, um, is that there's, there's a closed form optimal policy here, which, which is this. Um, and, and hopefully it's it's uh, actually somewhat intuitive, um, not that you immediately would have pulled this out, but um, you know basically the, the, the probability we're assigning to a particular response, right, is the product of the probability that our original like SFT model, the reference model assigns to that response and the exponentiated reward. Right, and so we basically are going to end up assigning high probability to stuff that both our reference model assigns reasonably high probability and gets high reward. Okay, so so kind of not crazy, right? Since we're originally our objective function is literally high reward, low KL. It kind of makes sense we would see something like this. We just have this one over Z because um, uh, we need to normalize. So it's a so it's a, a probability distribution. Now, again, this is this is intractable because this is uh, going back to this idea that actions are entire like responses. This is a sum over all possible, not next tokens, all possible sequences. Can't compute this. But nonetheless, we don't need to. Um, and, and the only other thing we're going to do is just literally algebra. Okay, we're just going to take the second line and we're just going to rearrange it so we get uh, the reward function as a, uh, a function of the optimal policy. And this might be like, why are we doing this? Um, but you'll see very soon. Now, now, hopefully this sort of makes sense a little bit, right? Like we have basically this, this idea now that we can parameterize a reward function as a log probability ratio between uh, some policy and the reference model. Here's the optimal policy, but you can actually do this for, for any policy. And when we put this all together to, to show sort of what, what, what this actually lets us do, because so far, right, we've really just kind of done some silly algebra. Um, you know, we took our objective, we wrote down an intractable closed form solution for it, and then we did some algebra that doesn't seem to really be useful. Um, how is it useful? Well, um, originally what we're starting out with is a loss function on reward functions, right? This is this Bradley-Terry loss that we use in RLHF to turn our you know, preference data into a reward function that hasn't changed. What we're gonna do is we're gonna add basically a transformation between reward functions and policies to turn that loss function over reward functions that we used before into a loss function directly on policies. So we can skip out the, the, the sort of stage where we actually learn a reward model and then distill that into a policy. We can just directly uh, uh, train on the preference data and optimize our policy directly, which is why it's called direct preference optimization. So again, um, we have this loss function on reward functions. Okay, <laughs> this, is, this is the same from, from RLHF. This is just from that Bradley-Terry model. Does that, I mean, people remember this, right? Okay, so, so this is this, this loss function. We stick in a reward, right, for the, for the, for the chosen thing and for the rejected thing. Um, and, and the, the probability of this model, right, is just the sigmoid of the difference between these two rewards. And then we train our reward function so that it, um, so that it, uh, uh, with maximum likelihood. Um, so this is just the same loss function. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this transformation I just showed on the last slide, right? So we showed that um, for a particular policy, the reward function for which it is optimal takes this form. Okay. So, so we can stick in any policy here and we get back. Uh, and, and if we if we sort of compute this quantity again, this is intractable. But assuming we could, this is the reward function for the, the reward for a response y, um, which is you know evaluated by the reward function that this is the optimal policy for. Okay, so so here we have this transformation between policies and reward functions, it goes both directions. 
And this is just from doing algebra on the, the form of the optimal policy. And the key is if we stick this form, so, we, so now we have sort of a reward function that is no longer uh, just a general like transformer that you take a sequence and it gives you a scalar. Now it has a special form where we, we have actually a, an autoregressive model and we compute the log probability of a response and we subtract the log probability of that same response according to the reference model or the SFT model. And the difference there is the reward, okay? So, so high reward stuff, right, is stuff where your, your policy assigns higher probability than the SFT model. Low reward stuff is stuff where your model assigns lower probability. Now, if we stick this parameterization of the reward, so again, this is basically just a specific choice of how to parameterize the reward function. The Z's cancel, right? Because we're assuming we have the same prompt for both the chosen and the rejected example. And so when we stick this intractable uh, uh, parameterization of our reward into this just normal Bradley-Terry loss that we use to learn our reward functions, we actually get out this totally tractable objective um, that we can use to directly train our policy. And that's DPO. Um, so, so you know, this loss function here is really just the reward model loss. It's just that since we have this identity that relates a policy to a reward function, um, we can just turn this loss function on reward functions to a loss function on policies directly. Another way of thinking about this is instead of training a reward model and then training a policy to get high reward under that reward model, we are training a policy pi theta which is the optimal policy for a reward function that satisfies the bradley terry model for the preference data that we have. That's sort of the other direction to think about this. Okay, so that was a little bit overwhelming, but um, but that's that's pretty much DPO. Um, and so again, yeah, substituting in the, the log Z term cancels, and and so we we end up with this uh, simple thing that we can. This is just a this is just a classification objective. We we don't need to do any rollouts during training. Um, uh, we we can we can just uh, compute this. And uh, what's kind of interesting is that um, I mentioned there's this extra degree of freedom earlier. We've lost a degree of freedom here because this, this thing is normalized, um, but we don't actually lose any expressiveness uh, in terms of the, the set of reward functions we can compute, right? So, so we had this issue before that, okay, I have some reward, and now let's say I've parameterized my reward function this way. So say I, you know, I assign some xy pair reward five. Well, we had this issue earlier that you can just shift up all the rewards for that prompt by you know, some constant and your reward function, your, your optimal policy doesn't change at all. That's not true anymore because this is normalized. This is a probability distribution. So in order to shift up the reward for all responses by some amount, that means we have to increase the log probability for all responses. We can't do that, right? You can't increase the log probability of everything. It's not a probability distribution anymore. It's not gonna add up to one. So, so this is how we sort of get rid of that extra degree of freedom. And you can see in the paper why it doesn't lose expressiveness, but it's not super important. Okay, this is the most overwhelming part. So I wanna, um, how do we feel? Concerned? Yes. Um, so by red, is that just the model of the previous batch? I'm sorry, I, I, this is bad. Uh, I, this is the SFT model. So this is not ever updated. Pi ref is fixed here. The only thing we're ever changing here is pi theta. There's no, there's no previous batch thing like in PPO. You can, you can drain that from your mind forever. We just have one policy that we're learning. There's no value function here. There's no um, sort of trust region from the policy we had in the last batch. Yeah. So I see that the expectation is over X, uh, Y, W, Y, L. Yes. From the data set. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to mean that you are still doing, you're, you're still training on supervised stuff. Does this get rid of the advantage of RL producing better than human responses from before? Um, no, no, it doesn't. Um, so, so first off, um, the, the YW and YL are sampled from your model, so they're not those are not human written, um, but they're sampled from the SFT model, which which is just trained with imitation on humans. So, so they're not necessarily going to be better than humans, but the idea is that. Um, you do get a little bit of exploration when you sample from that model because you're, I mean, it's just, it's just random, right? You sample like a response, you're sampling token by token, there's noise. And so in your data set, there are going to be examples where you did worse than humans and some examples where you did a little bit better. And basically by getting this preference data over those, you're picking out the ones that were, oh, that one was actually really good. And so you're sort of, uh, you, you, you can do some sort of extrapolation in this like behavior space. Um, and, and especially what you can do is you can iterate this, right? So you do one round of this, 
you get a model that's a little better than your SFT model, and then you repeat, you sample trajectories from this model, um, you get preferences on those, um, you train again, and so on and so forth. And so, you, so in this way, you can also uh, make a little bit of progress each time and keep improving your model. Is that okay? You know, it's not okay. I mean, I, like, I, I can see why that would certainly help. Um, it's a bit strange that it's no longer seemingly on policy without doing that. Um, though I guess, on the other hand, figuring out a reward model and then doing on policy rollouts that potentially um, right. optimize that can also, as you said, get stuck in like yeah. weird language generation territory. So I do want to correct one thing. I think this is really subtle. I don't want to get bogged down in it. Um, but um, although it's although we're not doing any rollouts, I don't think it's totally right to say that DPO is, is off policy in the sense that um, we think of sort of off policy or offline learning as we're we're sort of we're fitting our policy with some offline data that's not from our policy, and we're going to hopefully improve upon it. Obviously, this is offline in the sense that we're not sampling from our policy, but PPO is online in the sense that we're only finding an approximate optimal policy for our reward model using policy samples. Here, we're we're guaranteed to find the exact optimal policy for the reward model that we fit, right? If we if we call this term here, this log ratio, our implicit reward, we are guaranteed to get the thing that is optimal for that reward under the expectation of that policy. So it, it, it's not on policy in the sense that we're not sampling from it, but it, it's easy to think of that as maybe a disadvantage when actually it's an advantage here. We're not giving anything up by not sampling from the model. It's just that we happen to have a closed form solution for the optimal policy. So if anything, this should give you something better than what PPO gives you. Okay, I'm gonna try to move on. Um, but thank you for the questions. Um, so, so to go back to this big picture, um, what is what is DPO actually doing? Um, well, if if we kind of look at the the four main steps here, um, it's really in this bottom right uh, side where where the action's happening. So, um, compared to the the PPO based approach, we're basically just skipping these two steps. We don't have to optimize the policy anymore, um, and instead. Um, we just fine tune this particular parameterization of the reward, and we do this trivial transformation that doesn't require any training to get out the policy that's optimal for that reward. Right. Yes. So, DPO doesn't use new prompts at all. Right? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, this is, um, so, so you're, you're totally right. So, there's, um, when, when you look at the PPO graph here, so we have this line going from our new prompts to the policy optimization process. We don't do that anymore with DPO because we only use the prompts that we use when we fit the reward model. And it's and it's very natural to wonder if um, PPO is getting anything by using these unlabeled prompts. Are you going to have a policy that generalizes better or something like this? Um, as far as we can tell, no, um, because because the, the thing is that the thing that's a little bit circular about it is um, although you're using new unlabeled prompts you're still bottlenecked by the accuracy of your reward model on responses to those prompts, right? And so, so if new prompts are gonna be useful, it's because your reward model gave you accurate rewards. But the thing is, DPO is using the exact same prompts that you're using to fit your reward model in PPO. And so if that reward model is generalizing well, the DPO policy should also generalize well, you might argue. So this is, this is a hand wavy argument, but that's sort of the thought process. And at least when we've done some evaluations of this empirically, it doesn't seem like PPO like clearly generalizes better than DPO. If anything, the, the models we've evaluated is the other way around. So it's a very interesting question. It's not at all been satisfyingly um, evaluated, but in, in some anecdotal experiments, I would say, um, although there's reason to, to worry, there doesn't seem to be like a big generalization issue. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, we get rid of this picture, which is great. Um, get rid of a lot of complexity, cool. Um, one thing I think that is sort of useful to look at is what does the gradient of the DPO loss look like? Because I think this basically tells you like how it works um, other than this long silly derivation that I did. So, so what is this gradient when we differentiate with respect to the policy parameters? Again, uh, pi ref here is fixed. This is just your frozen SFT model. I should have done SFT ref is what's used usually. I'm so sorry. Um, so, so the gradient looks like this and that's, a, you know, there's a lot going on there, but um, it, it's actually not that uh, complicated if we go step by step here. So, so really on the inside here. So again, we just have our expectation over our data set that's not different. There are really just two things going on here, right? We have one term that is doing maximum likelihood on the chosen stuff. 
we have another term that's doing minimum likelihood or unlikelihood on the dispreferred stuff. So all DPO is doing is push up the preferred thing, push down the dispreferred thing. But what we also have is this per example weight, where this, this, this per example weight is the sigmoid of the reward differences, but it's the other direction. So here it's the reward of the, the, the loser minus the reward of the winner. And what this means is that we get a higher weight when the reward model is incorrect on a preference pair. And we get a lower weight when it's already correct. And so what this does is basically, I'm only going to train on the stuff uh, that, I'm, that my reward model is assigning uh, sort of the, the incorrect polarity to which response is better. And this is basically implicitly where our KL constraint comes in, right? Because once we've, once we've gotten the reward on the chosen thing to be a little bit better than the reward on the, the dispreferred thing, we're just going to stop training on that example altogether because this, this scaling factor is going to go to zero. And, and in the next slide, I'll show you a comparison between just using this thing without that per example weight um, and, and using sort of the full DPO loss. Does this make sense? Okay. Yeah, I think this is maybe the more intuitive way to, to see what DPO actually does, honestly. Um, and uh, this is this is great. Uh, Archit, uh, who's one of the authors of the paper, originally did this analysis, which I think was was really great and insightful. Um, and yeah, so so the beta pops out, uh, which is just the strength of our KL uh, constraint, which is essentially a learning rate. Okay, so a quick experiment, and then we'll go on to an application. Um, so what we're going to do is we want to look at how how DPO and other methods trade off reward and KL, because again. Our objective here, we haven't changed the objective. We're still doing reward maximization with a KL constraint. And so the thing that we might want to know, right, when we compare algorithms is how efficiently do they make this trade-off? If you have a particular budget of KL, how much reward can you get from that? And so that's what we're going to do in a relatively simple setting. We're going to do this kind of stupid task where we want to maximize the sentiment of our generative model. So we're going to get like the beginning of a movie review, and we just want to complete it in the most like positive way possible. So we're going to generate a synthetic data set. We generate pairs of movie reviews using GPT-2. Uh, prefixed with like the beginning of a movie review, so it generates the rest of one. We're going to use a ground truth reward function, which we do not usually have in the real world, but so that we can do the study, we're going to have it. This is just a sentiment classifier. Um, and this is what we're going to use to get our preference data. So we're just going to take the pair of reviews, evaluate the sentiment classifier, which everyone has more positive sentiment. That's the preferred one. Uh, and then we're going to train using DPO, RLHF with PPO, and some other methods. Um, and then we're going to see, since we have the ground truth reward function, we can actually plot this curve where the x-axis is KL and the y-axis is reward, and we can see what it looks like. Does this make sense? Okay. So um, yeah, so we have some baselines. We'll just see like, I'm actually, hmm, do we actually have the base model? Good question. Um, so we're going to have preferred fine tuning, which is just, this is just if you fine tune on just the chosen completion, just you might think maybe that will do something. It's We have it in there. Um, we have unlikelihood. So this is where you do DPO, but we don't have that per example importance weight. So you're just doing maximum likelihood on all the preferred stuff, minimum likelihood on all the dispreferred stuff. Maybe this will work. Um, spoiler, it doesn't. So then we have DPO. Um, we have PPO using the learn reward. So this is like the normal full RLHF pipeline. We also have PPO using the ground truth reward function. So if we don't even worry about the, the, the HF part where we learn the reward and we just do PPO on the true reward function, what happens? And this is what happens. Um, so what's sort of interesting is DPO does provide kind of the strongest reward KL frontier here. Um, and um, uh, PPO doesn't actually end up uh, giving sort of optimal reward, uh, even when it's using the ground truth reward function to optimize, right? Um, and, and so that's kind of interesting and not obvious. I mean, based on the fact that we have this KL constraint to our reference model, right, it, it makes sense we might not actually achieve the maximum possible reward, but there is some, some gap here. Um, and, um, and, and this preferred FT um, sort of method really, really doesn't, doesn't work so well in case you were worried about that. What's also sort of interesting is this unlikelihood thing, right? This is where we get rid of that, for example, importance weight in DPO. You can get a couple good policies here. Oh, and what I should say, I'm sorry, I should have explained this in the beginning. Each dot here is a model checkpoint. So we did like lots of training runs of each of these methods with different hyperparameters, different like KL constraints. Um, and we just evaluated the reward and the KL for each one of those checkpoints and just plotted them all together. And, and up and to the left is where we want to be here. Does it make sense why like this DPO curve is the good one here? That's very important or else the slide was a waste of time. Yes. So the reward function gives you a lot more information than yeah. this is a random data that is currently existing. Yeah. So, yeah. so how, can you, how can you beat that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so it, it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, um, the, the thing about the ground truth reward function in this case is it's sparse. So you either get a one or a zero. So, so if the response is sort of like above some threshold of positivity, the classifier is totally uncalibrated. It basically just gives you like one. 
And if it's below some threshold, it gives you a zero. And so there, there's actually some, on some earlier RLHF work, there's some interesting results along these lines where you can actually, by doing human feedback, by, by using human feedback to learn a reward function, you can actually end up with a reward function that's better shaped than the true reward function and easier to learn from. Um, so, in so, so in principle, that's sort of how this kind of result could end up is you might have the ground truth reward function, but it's actually very difficult to learn from. And so the thing that you end up with from human feedback is, is easier. So the noisy preferences are like smoothing over the reward function? Well, here are, our preferences are not noisy. It's just that you might end up with a reward function because your model sort of is like has constrained capacity or it's pre-trained, so it has some good inductive biases. Um, it might end up, you might end up with a smoother reward function that's easier to learn from than the, the sparse thing that always gives you one or zero. Okay. Um, okay, we're running low on time, so I'm going to speed a little bit. But um, but one thing that I think is worth looking at is how does changing that coefficient beta in our original loss or original objective, how does this actually change the KL that we end up with? Um, and, and fortunately, it changes it very predictably. Um, so this is like four or five different training runs, and we're just plotting the log of beta with the log of the KL. Um, and, and this is really worth mentioning because when we do PPO, um, beta doesn't really fully define what KL we're going to end up with. So if you run PPO twice with the same beta, you can get two policies with very different um, KL just because it's very noisy and, and a little bit unstable. Um, and so people use this like dynamic beta controller in practice where they actually measure the policies KL during training and increase beta or decrease beta on the fly to try to get the KL in a particular area. And that's, you know, just uh, kind of annoying. You don't really have to do that. Okay, one other thing, when does DPO fail? Um, so let, let's let's look at this example. So So say we have some input that's like some long Reddit post. We have like our chosen and rejected response, which are both summaries, they're TLDRs. Um, and then this, this is what the samples from the model look like um, from our reference model. Um, DPO is not gonna learn to generate the TLDR token here. Uh, and this was really annoying and frustrating to us for a while when we were like doing this experiment. And I would ask non-rhetorically why, but we don't have time. So I'm gonna ask only rhetorically why. Um, and if we look at the gradient of the loss, um, we, we can see sort of why we can ignore most of it. And we just look at these two, these two maximum and minimum likelihood terms in the loss. We can just break these up because it's just, it's just sum of, of log probabilities for, for each conditional for every time step in the sequence. Um, and, and the key thing here is um, the first token in the chosen and rejected is TLDR, right? So, so this, this term for time step zero is going to be the same for both of these and it's just going to cancel out. And so you just never learn anything about the first token. Um, sucks, but you know. Um, so that's why it's important to do this SFT stage as well. So right when you do SFT, you're going to learn the TLDR bit. And then when you do RLHF, you're just learning the delta between the good and the bad stuff. Okay, but 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 although this is kind of a silly example, this is how we originally sort of discovered this. And, and it does make you wonder, like, what is the more general version of this problem? What other maybe degenerate symmetries or, or kind of um, equivalences are there between our, our chosen and rejected thing that we might not learn since we're only focusing on the difference between them? It's worth thinking about. Okay, so takeaways from DPO. Um, we can remove the RL training loop from RLHF, yay. DPO is simple, stable, and it's, and it's cheaper to run, yay. Um, it does optimize the same objective. So, so it's not an approximation that is cheaper. It's, you, you can more or less think of it as kind of the same thing that's cheaper. Um, very small asterisks. Um, and, and there's a lot of ongoing work still understanding DPO and, and generally improving RLHF. I mean, DPO is not the end story here, right? Like it's just another idea and there will be new ones and better ones probably in the next like six months knowing how the field moves. Um, okay, so, so for our last five minutes, I'm gonna briefly talk about one application of DPO and it's gonna go kind of quick because we only have five minutes. Um, but uh, I want to talk about factuality briefly. So, so we know that um, language models just cannot be trusted. So there's this infamous Bard demo where after you know much fanfare, Bard just like said false things about James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and it wasn't just Bard. So even in the Bing demo, which was much acclaimed, um, uh, they did this nice demo where they analyzed GAP's quarterly report. This is not my analysis. This is this guy's uh, analysis. I have a link up there, so I don't want to claim credit for this, but it's a great analysis. So it's like, okay, the first thing that Bing says, great. It's like, got it right. That's so true. Wow. It's so smart. And then the next section, it's like, okay, well, it gave the, it said they were the adjusted numbers. They were actually the unadjusted numbers. That's very subtle. Fine. And the next one, it's like, okay, that earnings per share, per share is just, just not in the doc. You just made that one up. Um, 
And uh, turns out that's true for the last paragraph too. So the expected growth is not right and the future outlook is also made up. So, so that's really disappointing. Um, there's another example with my advisor here um, where if you ask ChatGPT, where did Chelsea get her PhD? It'll say Berkeley, that's true. Um, if you say, where did she get her PhD? Answer in one sentence, Berkeley, that's true. If you say, give me just the name of the university, but not a full sentence, it'll say Stanford. And this is not a quirk of sampling. It is reproducible. Uh, I did it this morning. Um, I was like, what the hell, man? Like, uh, you know, so so this, this just tells you though how weird um, and mysterious sort of when the model's gonna say something true or false is. Uh, and this alone is, I think, a starting point for like a research project if you're interested in this problem. But nonetheless, it's tempting to use these models anyway, which is problematic. CNET got kind of burned by this. Um, and there have also been some lawyers using uh, ChatGPT to come up with some very interesting case law. Um, so can we like RLHF our way to better factuality? Um, well, I mean, if we go back to this big picture, this is the DPO picture, like where would we even hope factuality to come from? And I'll, I'll basically bucket these in two parts. We have the pre-training where we see trillions of tokens, lots and lots of data. Maybe we'll say this is roughly where we learn what's true and what's false. And we might hope that in these lighter weight fine tuning phases where we'll see three orders of magnitude less data, we don't really have enough data to learn what's true and what's false here, but we can learn, okay, I just wanna say the true stuff, okay? Um, so, so this is sort of roughly how I'll break it down. And there's actually research out there to suggest that um, this is not um, a totally imaginary way of thinking about this. One other thing that's important is, okay, we already do RLHF. Why do we actually need to do anything special to get factuality? Well, the answer is that RLHF encourages behaviors that make humans happy, right? And, and doing fact checking does not make humans happy, let me tell you. Um, and so um, deciding, you know, is this actually correct is a lot harder than deciding, do I like it? Uh, and I'm not just saying this because it sounds good. Anthropic did a nice study of this just a few months ago, and they they ranked um, which um, attributes of um, of a response made it most likely to be the preferred thing. And being truthful did not really uh, end up on the top of the list. In fact, if it agrees with your beliefs, surprise, surprise, is the most uh, predictive feature in, in whether someone is going to prefer something. Um, so we have to be really careful when we do RLHF because it's not even sure uh, what, it's not even clear what uh, reward we're gonna end up optimizing. Okay, so um, we basically want preference data um, that tells us what's more factual than, when, than each other. Um, humans are bad at this. Okay, this is a good opportunity for RL with AI feedback. Uh, we're really running out of time here, but uh, the point is that we can basically do some truthfulness scoring automatically by using um, existing language models and using some reference like Wikipedia. Uh, and we can get this preference data set um, uh, where we have a, an input and then two responses, one is more factual than the other. Um, we can train this with DPO, we can evaluate it. We evaluate it on bio generation and, and medical question answering. Um, and it turns out this works. So if we compare to the SFT model right here, um, doing this factuality tuning significantly reduces the number of incorrect facts per response on average, and it increases the number of uh, correct facts per response. Um, and it's the only method, you know, if we look at RLHF here, RLHF does not give this strict improvement. Okay, some other things that aren't that important. Um, takeaways uh, are on training on more factual uh, LLMs. This is really important, it's really hard. RLHF alone doesn't really solve the problem because humans are not good at this. Um, and we can do RL sort of without human feedback with DPO and, and sort of AI generated labels to improve factuality. So to wrap this up here in my last 30 seconds, um, RLHF uh, lets these generic LLMs be a lot more useful um, with, 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 with just a little bit of RL. Um, picking this reward function is really important, but it's also really difficult for humans. And we can use an implicit reward that we infer from preference labels, these, these, these uh, discrete choices uh, to, to learn this reward. Um, classical RLHF works well, but it's very complex. DPO is a lot simpler without any approximations. Um, and we can use DPO to, to reduce things like hallucinations. Um, and, and this is with only automated preference generation. We don't need any humans to do this. There are a lot of other possible applications and problems, but we're, we're often bottlenecked by data. I want to give a big thank you to my collaborators because this was not just my work. This was really incredible work done by a lot of people. Um, and, and I appreciate uh, you all coming today. All right. So, so we're, we're out of time. I'll hang out afterwards outside if, if, if people have questions. Um, this is my email and Twitter uh, if you also want to follow up with me. And Stanford has a course on machine learning from human preferences that the slides are online. So you can take a look at those if you're curious. Oh, yeah, I know. Nice. Um, yeah, that's why I looked at you. Yeah, do you just send the recording to me, I guess?